Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the Sabbath. I thank you for your strength and your grace. I thank you that you ordain events like the wheel within the wheel and you've prepared the way ahead of me and I pray that you would speak through me, that your Holy Spirit would be here, that you would be with my brothers and sisters and help them and me too to receive the message that you have for us today. And I thank you so much, Father. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I have to say that when Kaylin came home and told me that Kevin said, can you speak Sabbath? I was like, are you kidding? Because we had a lot going on this week. We have a lot happening and a lot to prepare for. But initially I told Kevin no, and the Lord gave me a spanking and said, yes, you would will. And so he started laying some things on my heart. And, and I know that it was God laying it on my heart because from the mission, the story that you shared before Sabbath school, to the mission story, to everything in the Sabbath school lesson, and I have to confess, I hadn't looked at the Sabbath school lesson, I had no idea what it was about, but it all fits hand in glove with what the Lord has laid on my heart to share today. And I love it when He does that because it, it teaches us faith, it teaches us how to listen to God's Word and to know this is God leading. And so, we're going to talk about our heads today, and what goes on in our heads. And the title, if I had to put a title on it, is Watch Your Head. And so, um, I want to, we're going to look at one particular person, a scriptural person, um, today. But before we do that, I want to show you a few things before we get there. Have you ever read that your thoughts produce your feelings, your feelings produce your actions, your actions produce your habits, your habits produce your character, and your character <coughs> determines your destiny. So if you look at the end of this, your destiny depends on what? Your thoughts. Your thoughts. So what is, what's going on in your head from day to day is determining your destiny. And so I think that that is a very crucial point that we need to think about very uh, candidly. And the reason I believe that is because here, and we touched on this in Sabbath school, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, we know that the dragon is angry with the woman. Who's, who's the dragon? Satan. Satan. Who's the woman? That's church. The church, okay. And he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it's, and I'm sure you've all done this. You've taken um, a magnifying glass and you focus the sun's rays on something, and what happens? It starts burning. You can start a fire, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's what I see when I see this verse that the devil is so angry. He knows he has very little time, and so his wrath is focused on that group of people. This is current event, by the way. We are in this time right now, and his anger is focused on those who are determined to keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And so this is us. And we know, too, that the scenes of the crucifixion are soon to be repeated. What happened in Christ's time was that church and state united to destroy him. Isn't that what's going to happen in the end? And who was it that delivered Christ to be destroyed? It was the church leaders, wasn't it? That's what's going to happen again. That's what we're told. That's what the Bible tells us. Okay, so church and state united to destroy Christ. Church and state are going to unite to destroy God's, to attempt to destroy God's people and are going to severely persecute God's people in the final scenes. And so, Revelation 13, 16, and 17 says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark in their right hand or in, as Caleb pointed out, it's in their forehead. That has to do with the way you think. On the hand or in the hand has to do with what you do. Here is what you're thinking. 
okay? So that they may not buy or sell unless we had the number, the mark, or the number, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And so what goes on here is very crucial because we are on the doorstep of this happening right here. And I want to show you in current events, and we'll, we're going to, I'm, I'm kind of going to look a little bit like a butterfly flitting from flower to flower today in the beginning. But bear with me because the things that I share in the beginning, we're going to go somewhere. I'm going to show a little bit of a video clip in just a little bit. It's very interesting. But we're going to talk not only about what we should think, but what we shouldn't think. Jesus said, in an hour that you think not, I'm coming. And so we may be casually going about our day-to-day -day business not thinking that something's going to happen even the next day that could seal my fate. And so I want to show you a video after the next slide that will show that how fast did the whole world shut down 2020. Just like that. And that is just how fast this world can change overnight. Now, I'm going to show you this little video clip. I'm going to step aside. I'm going to let this play. It's a couple minutes long. But I tell you, this is a story that you probably never heard. You may have. I'm sure you heard of the event. This took place during the um, earthquake in Haiti. Um, I forget what year that was. Does anybody remember what year? I don't remember exactly. It hasn't been that long ago. But watch this, and then we'll be back. Okay? The ruins of Haiti, the signs aren't good. It's day six. The diggers tear at the rubble, making survival beneath unlikely. The scavengers at the bank search for money, not the living. One man looks on. Roger still believes his wife a bank worker just might be alive. He rushes in every time ground is cleared. This time, someone hears a noise. He calls for silence, then for his wife, Jeanette. Okay, she's there, she's alive, he says. They scrape away stones to expose a small hole and allow the first light to reach the woman in six days, her husband overwhelmed. I can hear Jeanette talking. I put a microphone in and ask her if she's injured. Yes, she says, my fingers are broken. She tells me she needs water, it would be a great pleasure. I'm thirsty and I can't see, she says. Then, a message for her husband. Even if I die, I love you so much. Don't forget it. The risk of her dying remains. Not her husband, nor anyone here has the equipment to get her out. Would you like to take a look? Suddenly, help arrives. Firefighters from Los Angeles. They push a tiny camera into the hole. Okay. And Jeanette okay. is okay, revealed. At, uh, hang on, let's try to figure out her body moving. orientation. So, All right, we're going to get you something to drink first. They get her water and then begin cutting into the cables and beams around her. The light is fading. Hope is not. Then our first clear sight of her. Dust in her eyes, smiling. Wincing, but alive. Okay, all quiet. It's amazing. She's in incredible shape for for the time period she's been in there. You confident you'll get her right? Oh yeah, I, I'm very confident. There is just one major worry now: an aftershock. We may not have a whole lot of time. Once it goes, it goes. Okay. Come on. On a camera, they've seen Jeanette's hand pinned under a beam. Free it, and she's free. A rescuer reaches her hand. She is in pain. Oh. Hang in there, Jeanette. All right, Jeanette, we're almost there. But within three hours of first hearing her voice, she emerges. One, two, three. Her first words, thank you, God, and then an astonishing moment. The words of her song, don't be afraid of death. 
She told me she always thought she'd survive, but she wondered why this had happened to her. Did you think you would, you would live, Jeanette? Did you think you would live? Live? Yeah. Why not? Well, this has been an absolutely remarkable rescue. The most remarkable thing of all is the life that's bursting from this woman's lungs. But obviously, six days after this earthquake, the chances of finding anyone else alive in this rubble are now very slim. All right, nice and easy. Hi, Jeanette. Jeanette Sanfor is alive, and for her husband, it's a miracle. But her survival is the exception in a city of death. She drove away as if nothing had happened to see for herself the horror that had been hidden from her. Bill Neely for NBC News in Port-au-Prince. Can a human live without water? Three days. Anybody know? Three days. I heard three days back there. How long was she in there? Six. Six. Six days. Watch your head. Watch your head. She came out, what was the first thing she did when she came out? Praise God. Yeah. I watched a follow-up interview on this, and I, I couldn't find it, but I, I did, I saw a follow-up interview. She heard her husband every time he called for her, and she responded, but he could not hear her. But faith kept him calling and reaching out to her, and I believe that that kept her hope up, you know? And so... She also said that the whole time she was in there, she was reciting scriptures. She was claiming God's promises. And so we have a crisis coming. I love this video clip, and I've used it in many different presentations. And so she asked the question, why did this happen to me? And she has no idea how much I have used this clip to help God's people to see the preparation that we need to be making for what we're about to face. She had no idea when she woke up that morning what she was going to face that day. But she was prepared because day by day she was watching her head. Okay, let's move on. Retired U.S. Army generals warn of insurrection and civil, civil war in 2024 if rogue military units pledge loyalty to a Trumpian loser. Did you know that we are very well on the verge of civil war? And here's another. Expert predicts potential U.S. civil war and the fall of democracy in part of the see here part of the writing in the article says millions of armed militia threaten to seize power if Donald Trump loses the 2024 presidential election that's called civil war we are on the verge of this and retired generals are warning that we are very near to civil war and then there's food anybody notice food prices lately anybody notice it's like twice what it was just a few years ago to go and buy groceries. This was all predicted. This was written in 1890. In India, China, Russia, and the cities of America, thousands of men and women are dying of starvation. The moneyed men, because they have the power, control the market. They purchase at low rates all that they can obtain, and then they sell at greatly increased prices this means starvation to the poorer classes and will result in what? Civil war. Civil war. There will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. One of the money men in the United States is Bill Gates. He owns 290,000 acres, which is predominantly farmland. Just for comparison, Sheridan County is 622,000 acres. So that's a good chunk of land that this man owns. Like half of the county. What's that? It's like half of the county. Correct. Yes, that's true. Okay. Bill Gates is the largest owner of private farmland in the U.S. with acreage across 18 states. I thought it was interesting. The two states that he owns the most land in are Louisiana and Arkansas. That surprised me. That's right where the Mississippi River runs through. I don't know if there's a connection. I have no idea, but I found that quite interesting. 
And then, have you heard of the doomsday clock? Has anybody heard of the scientific doomsday clock? Scientists have this clock. I think it started like in the 1940s. And they, they move the hand closer or farther away from midnight depending on world events and how unstable they feel things are. January of this year, they moved the clock 90 seconds to midnight. That's the closest it has ever been in the history of the doomsday clock. So things are happening in this world. And then the United States is developing digital currency. You know, if there's digital currency, you mentioned that you got to go down there and you, you, gotta, you can't go down there and write a check. You got to do it online. It's got to be done digitally. When things are controlled digitally, how easy would it be to control buying and selling? How easy would it be to flip off the switch on your finances? It's happening. It's being developed right now in the United States. Okay? Biden's pandemic treaty would surrender power to WHO bureaucrats, WHO is, is the World Health Organization. This actually happened. All nations, uh, I think all of the major nations now, I don't know, I don't have a list of, of actual, but it's most of the European nations, the United States is now part of this, have signed over their, uh, their loyalty to the World Health Organization so that the next time there's a pandemic, Whatever the WHO, the World Health Organization, says to do, we have to follow suit. We have to do that. Okay, so the WHO is now in control of the United States pandemic response. Okay, and now we have global certificate system, which is launching. This is going to control your health as well as your travel. If you don't have your digital health certificate, you will no longer be able to travel. Um, or and this is June 6, 2023, so that's pretty current. Today is what, the 9th? 10th. 10th? Okay, 10th. So this is like hot off the press. All right, here's why AI, who knows what AI is? AI is artificial intelligence. Here in North Dakota, we may think that it's got something to do with cattle, but that's not what they're talking about. AI is extremely dangerous, artificial intelligence. Scientists do not know how this is working, but these computed computers are becoming sentient. In other words, they're beginning to think. They're becoming so advanced that humans don't, will no longer be able or have the need to program them. They're actually carrying on conversations. And if you don't know, AI has been used to resurrect the dead. People can go to, uh, there's different uh, web pages and stuff that you can go to and they have so much information on people who have died that they can actually reproduce that person and you can chat with them. Okay? We know what that is. That is spiritualism. All right? They've also done that with Ellen White. You can go and chat with Ellen White. Yeah, okay. we've heard that. Yes. It's it's very, very current, very real that's happening. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that scientists have said that is so scary is they don't know how this is happening. They don't understand what's going on in these computers that's causing them to become sentient or thinking. I believe that demons <coughs> are getting into these computers and, and using them, speaking through them. And then there's the extreme weather events. You know, we have all these four, the other, not too long ago, it's were two weeks ago, it was so smoky here from the fires up in, in Canada. Okay, we have all that. And then RFK, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says billionaires are using climate change to create totalitarian controls. Are we going to be under a totalitarian regime in the end? Indeed we are. It's right on our doorstep. Okay? And then there's COP27. COP stands for United Nations Climate Change Conference of the Parties. This is where all the nations come together and they discuss what they're going to do about climate change. Okay, this um, happened recently and the Pope is very involved in this. And if you've not heard about his, encycl his latest encyclical, which was entitled Laudato Si, it's, it's steeped with this climate change um, stuff and he also talks about a day of rest for the planet. And which day do you think that might be? Sunday. Yes, Pope connects Sunday keeping with a better environment. And there's already nations in Europe that have um, a free Sunday 
that they don't work on Sunday. They, they used to have the blue laws and they're still on the books here. You probably know that. Oh, the blue yeah. laws are still on the books. They're just not enforced here in North Dakota. Okay, a couple more slides here. Ke how Kevin McCarthy finally became Speaker of the House. It took 15 rounds of voting to get this man in as Speaker of the House. And you know, the only way that he got in was that he made a concession that he would work to destroy the separation of church and state. This is the third most powerful person in the United States government. He's right behind the Vice President. And he has vowed to labor against the separation of church and state. What was it that destroyed Christ in the end? It was when church and state came together. Brothers and sisters, we need to watch our heads. We need to be thinking very soberly because we're right at the end, because we know that whatever we're thinking determines our destiny, okay? Let's move forward now. I don't know how long this is gonna take me because I've, I've never given this presentation, but I'll try to get through it all. In John chapter one, we see where uh, Peter meets Jesus. Let's just quickly turn there. I am there already, so I'll read it. John chapter one, and I'm going to ask some of you to read, so I'll give you scriptures in just a minute. John 1, 40 through 42. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus looked at Peter, he said, You're Simon, the son of Jonah, and you shall be called Cephas, which is by interpretation. A stone. As you can see up here, he was a stone. He was hard, he was stubborn, but he possessed excellent qualities. And Christ saw that. Christ saw his failure, he saw his denial, betrayal, everything right at the beginning, and he still loved him. He still received him in to be one of his disciples. And then the next one I'd like to look at is Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Kaylin, would you please take your Bible and turn to Matthew 14? That's the next one. Luke uh, chapter 5, I'm sorry. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. This is a picture of um, Peter was still working as a fisherman at the time. He hadn't joined Jesus full time in ministry and following discipleship. But Jesus was speaking to the people in verse 1, and he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, but the people were pressing him so much that he really needed some space so that people could hear and see him because people were pressing so close. So Jesus, verse 2, saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, which is Peter, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And when he was, had left off speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon said, We have been fishing all night long and haven't caught one thing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. So in the face of seeming impossibility, this man, Okay, I will obey. I will. Nevertheless, even though I have failed all night, Nevertheless, you said it, so I'm going to obey. And then what happened? They filled up their net, and the other boat had to come and help them. And the boats were about to sink with all the fish. And what does Peter do? Let's go down to verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. And so, what would you think if you saw a man like this who had been so obedient, just immediate obedience and cooperation with Christ, okay? And then, when he sees this miracle, he bows down and says, I'm unclean, Lord, depart from me. But here he's clinging to his feet. He won't let him go, okay? You, when you see a person like that, you think, here's somebody who's very dedicated, who's very serious who's very committed. This was the man that Peter was. He was very earnest in his commitment to Christ and his desire to follow him. 
Okay, Kaylin, I'm going to have you read the next, Matthew chapter 14, verses 28 to 31. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, and caught him, and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? So, here again, we're seeing this incredible faith in this man. Any of us ever walked on the water? I haven't. You know? But here he has the faith. Jesus, if it's you, call me. I want to come to you. And he comes, but he glances back in a little bit of, you know, boat. Maybe a wave comes up and separates him from Christ. And what happens? Glug, 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 glug. And he cries out and Jesus saves him. So we see this, this intensity in Peter's life that to me, I, I can really identify with Peter because he was so forward. He was always the one speaking. And sometimes, as we'll see in the next slide, in the next story, it's in Matthew chapter 16, verse 22 and 23, if you want to turn there. Um, Jesus had been telling the disciples about his sufferings. And what does Peter do? Matthew 16, 22 and 23. I'm there, so I'll read it. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me. Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now he wasn't calling Peter Satan. We know that. He was talking to Satan who was tempting and speaking through Peter. So think about that. Here's this man who had exercised extreme faith to walk on water, who had obeyed the Lord when they had failed in fishing all night long, and now when Jesus is telling of his sufferings, Peter grabs divinity, the Son of God, because Peter had just confessed, you're the Son of God, and rebuked him. No, this will not be. You will not suffer. I think the next slide is one that I want. Yes, this is something called confirmation bias. Let's look at this just a minute. This is what caused Peter to fall. Confirmation bias is the tendency to look for information that supports rather than rejects one's preconceptions. Typically by interpreting evidence to confirm existing beliefs while rejecting or ignoring any conflicting data. Has anybody ever done that? Yes, I have too. We see what we want to see. We hear what we want to hear. And that's where Peter was right in that last scene that we looked at. No, he didn't want to see the cross. He didn't want to see the suffering. Watch your thoughts. We're watching Peter because we, we want to learn from his experience. All of his devotion, all of his, you know, he left his nets and he followed Christ and he was a disciple of Christ and yet here we see him rebuking the Son of God. And so watch your head. Watch what's going on in your thoughts. That's why we sang the song at the beginning from Psalm 139. Search me, O God. Try me and know my thoughts. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and we don't even know our own hearts. So we, we really need to have the Lord to search us. This confirmation bias, the effect is stronger for emotionally charged issues and for deeply entrenched beliefs. Now, the Jews were deeply entrenched in their ideas of the Messiah. The, who was the Messiah in their mind? The Messiah was conquering. He was going to come and conquer the earth and put down the Romans and make the Jewish nation great again. Okay? That's what they believed. All right? This is also why the disciples were arguing about who's going to be top dog in the new kingdom. Okay? Watch your head. This preconception caused them great failure in the crisis ahead. 
Next scene, who wants to read Mark chapter 9, verses 2 and 8? Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. I, I chose, this story is in um, other places too, but I chose Mark because I like the way it says in this story, Mark 9, 2 through 8. I got it. Okay, nice and loud so the camera can pick it up. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into the high mountains apart by themselves and he was transfigured before them and his remnant became shining exceeding white as snow so as no fuller on earth can whiten them and there appeared unto them Elias, Elias with Moses and, and they were taken with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one of the, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were so afraid. Okay, let's stop right there. He turned to Jesus and he said, let's make a tabernacle here. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And why does this say he said that? Because that wist not means he didn't have a clue what to say. So he just said something. That's why I say sometimes I can really relate to Peter because it's open mouth and insert foot, you know. So it, it was... What I want to communicate to us today is let's learn from this man. Let's think about what he was thinking, what was going on in his head. And as we go forward, we're going to look and see because Jesus is going to reveal what was and what wasn't going on in Peter's head. Okay? Next scene, Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 to 35. Matthew chapter 26, verses 31. We're near the end of, of the story with Peter. And then we're going to make some applications. Matthew 26, 31 to 35. You got it, Kevin? Mm -hmm. Okay, go for it. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Thou, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. So here again, he's arguing with Jesus. No. Jesus had told him, you're going to deny me. Jesus had warned him. And all of these interactions between Jesus and Peter heretofore, we know that Jesus had been warning him, warning him, even though you're committed, even though you're my disciple, even though you allowed me to minister in your home and we tore up your roof for somebody to be lowered in and you had to fix your roof, all of these things that you've done for me, but you're going to deny me. And Peter was dumbfounded. He couldn't believe, he was offended. And I'm going to read something to you here um, that will show that. In fact, I think I have a slide on that. Yes. Desire of Ages 663 to 664. When Peter said that he would follow his Lord to prison and to death, he meant it, every word of it. But he did not know himself. Hidden in his heart were elements of evil that circumstances would fan into life. Unless he was made conscious of his danger, and isn't that what Jesus was trying to do? Make him conscious of his danger? Yes. 
Unless he was made conscious of his danger, these would prove his eternal ruin. There's destiny. The Savior saw in him a self-love and assurance that would overbear even his love for Christ. Much of infirmity, of unmortified sin, carelessness of spirit, unsanctified temper, he would fly off the handle. We're going to see that in just a minute. Heedlessness in entering into temptation had been revealed in his experience. Christ's solemn warning was a call to heart searching. Peter needed to distrust himself and have a deeper faith in Christ. Had he, in humility, received the warning, he would have appealed to the shepherd of the flock to keep his sheep. When on the Sea of Galilee he was about to sink, he cried, Lord, save me! Then the hand of Christ was outstretched to grasp his hand, and so now, if he had cried to Jesus, save me from myself, he would have been kept. But, somebody read this with me. Let's read this together. But Peter <coughs> felt that, that he, he was, was distrusted, and he, and he thought, thought it cruel. <coughs> He was already offended and became more persistent in his self-confidence. This man is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Son of God. And he had confessed him as the Son of God. No! You've offended me. I will not deny you. You don't know me. But Jesus read his heart. And he knew him. And he knew what was coming. And did Peter fail him? Yes, he did. Okay? Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 26, verse 51 to 54. Matthew 26, 51 to 54. Just very shortly after Jesus had warned him, And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. John tells us who that was. John 18.10 tells us that was Peter. And Jesus said, Put up the sword into his place. Now why... Why do you think Peter cut off Malchus, Mal I think it was Malchus, I think I have it here. Why do you think that Peter cut off his ear? Why would you cut off somebody's ear if you're trying to stop them? Here's what I think. I think Malchus had good reflexes. Peter was aiming to take his head off. And Malchus gave a duck and it, Peter got his ear. Peter was serious. He was fixing to kill that man to save Christ from suffering because he didn't believe that the Messiah was going to be his preconceptions had so formed his thinking it was just deep in his head you're not going to suffer you're the Messiah you're going to be crowned king and I'm going to be the prime minister oh excuse me <laughs> hope they didn't hear that <laughs> yes so this is where Peter is thinking and when Jesus rebuked him here in Gethsemane and actually healed the servant's ear, Peter was so dumbfounded that he split. And all the other disciples followed him. They forsook Christ. And then I want to read from Desire of Ages. This is a little bit of a lengthy passage, so please stick with me as I read this because I cannot say it any better than the prophet of God has said it. This is from Desire of Ages, starting with page 695 to 699. This is when Jesus was being tried. You've probably read this, but I'm going to give a little emphasis, okay? Starting in, on 695, paragraph 1, But a keener anguish rent the heart of the Son of God. The blow that inflicted the deepest pain no enemy's hand could have dealt while he was undergoing the mockery of an examination before Caiaphas, Christ had been denied by his own disciples. After deserting, deserting their master in the garden, two of the disciples had ventured to follow at a distance the mob that had Jesus in charge. This was Peter and John. The priest recognized John as a well-known disciple of Jesus and admitted him to the hall, hoping that as he witnessed the humiliation of his leader, he would scorn the idea of such a one being the Son of God. And John spoke in favor of Peter and gained an entrance for him. In the court, a fire had been kindled, for it was the coldest hour of the night, being just before the dawn. A company drew about the fire, and Peter presumptuously took his place with them, the mob, 
that was there mocking Christ. So here's this man who had just mocked, just days before sworn his loyalty to Christ, and now he's kind of stepping over to the enemy's side. Okay? He's beginning his downfall. By mingling carelessly with the crowd, he hoped to be taken for one of those who had brought Jesus to the hall. But as light flashed upon Peter's face, we know this part, I'll summarize it. A woman recognized him, you're his disciple. What did he say? Woman, I don't know that man. This was the first denial and immediately the cock crew. Oh Peter, so soon ashamed of thy master, so soon to deny thy Lord. The disciple John, upon entering the judgment hall, did not try to conceal the fact that he was a follower of Jesus. He did not mingle with the rough company. Be careful what company you keep. Who were reviling his master. He was not questioned, for he did not assume a false character, and thus lay himself liable to suspicion. He sought a retired corner, secure from the notice of the mob, but as close to Jesus as he could get. Peter had not designed that his real character should be known. In assuming an air of indifference, mm, I'm just here, I'm just part of the crowd, I'm just blending in, what's going on? He's just playing like he, just part of the crowd, that's all. Okay? Many who do not shrink from active warfare with their Lord are driven by ridicule to deny their faith. By associating with those whom they should avoid, they place themselves in the way of temptation. They invite the enemy to tempt them. And they are led to say and do that which under other circumstances they would never have been guilty. The disciple of Christ who in our day disguises his faith through dread of suffering or reproach denies his Lord just as really as did Peter in the judgment hall. Peter tried to show no interest in the trial of his master, but his heart was wrung with sorrow. Peter really loved Jesus, but he just loved himself a little bit more. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. He was, he saw the, uh, he, his heart was wrung with sorrow as he heard the cruel taunts and saw the abuse Jesus was suffering. More than this, he was surprised and angry that Jesus would humiliate himself and his followers by allowing himself to be treated this way. In order to conceal his true feelings, he endeavored to join with the persecutors of Jesus in their untimely jest. So he actually began to jest at Christ. But his appearance was unnatural. He was acting a lie. And while seeking to talk unconcernedly, he could not restrain expressions of indignation at the abuse heaped upon his master. Attention was called to him a second time, and he was again charged with being a follower of Jesus. Now he declared with an oath, I do not know the man. Still another opportunity was given him. An hour had passed when one of the servants of the high priest, being a near kinsman of the man who, whose ear Peter had cut off, asked him, didn't I see you in the garden? Surely you're one of them. Thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeth thereto. At this, what did Peter do? He flew into a rage. There's the unsanctified temper. The disciples of Jesus were noted for the purity of their language, and in order to deceive his questioners and justify his assumed character, Peter now denied his master with cursing and swearing, and again the cock crew. Peter heard it then, and he remembered the words of Jesus. Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. While the degrading oaths were fresh upon Peter's lips, and the shrill crowing of the cock was still ringing in his ears, the Savior turned from the frowning judges and looked full upon his poor disciple. And at the same time, Put yourself here, friends, put yourself here, that you've just denied him, your eyes are drawn to him, and Jesus is looking at you. In that gentle countenance, he read deep pity and sorrow 
but there was no anger there. We don't need to despair when we fail the Lord, but we do need to repent Amen. and do what Peter did. The sight of that pale, suffering face, those quivering lips, that look of compassion and forgiveness, here he's looking at Christ. He's looking at his head. Watch your head. He's looking at Christ. The sight of that pale, suffering face, those quivering lips, that look of compassion and forgiveness, pierced his heart like an arrow. Conscience was aroused. Memory was active. Peter called to mind his promise of a few short hours before that he would go with his Lord to prison and death. He remembered his grief when the Savior told him in the upper chamber that he would deny his Lord thrice that same night. Peter had just declared that he knew not Jesus, but now he realized with bitter grief how well his Lord knew him and how accurately he had read his heart, the falseness of which was unknown even to himself. A tide of memories rushed over him. The Savior's tender mercy, his kindness and long-suffering, his gentleness and patience toward his erring disciples, Peter remembered it all. He recalled the caution, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that thy faith fail not. He reflected with horror upon his own ingratitude, his falseness, his perjury. Once more he looked at his head, at his master, and he saw a sacrilegious hand raised to smite him in the face. Unable longer to endure the scene, he rushed, heartbroken, from the hall. He pressed on in solitude and darkness. He knew not and cared not whither. At last he found himself in Gethsemane. The scene of a few hours before came vividly to his mind. The suffering face of his Lord, stained with bloody sweat and convulsed with anguish, rose before him. He remembered with bitter remorse that Jesus had wept and agonized in prayer alone, while those who should have united with him in that trying hour were sleeping. He remembered his solemn charge, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. He witnessed again the scene in the judgment hall. It was torture to his bleeding heart to know that he had added the heaviest burden to the Savior's humiliation and grief on that very spot where Jesus had poured out his soul in agony to his Father, Peter fell on his face and wished that he might die. It was in sleeping when Jesus bade him watch and pray that Peter had prepared the way for his great sin. So. All the disciples, by sleeping in that critical hour, sustained a great loss. And so, Peter learned, he wasn't watching his head, his thoughts, but he learned to watch his true head, which was Christ. And that is what kept Peter from doing what Judas did. We know what Judas did. Judas hung, hanged himself. And it was the realization of that tender, pitying compassion of Christ that kept Peter from doing the same. His remorse was so great. great. So, in reflection on the life of Peter, the path to failure, look at this first bullet point. Let's read this together. I know it might be small. The path to failure begins with the thoughts. <coughs> By sleeping when you should be praying, by cherishing your preconceptions, by refusing to be corrected, by affirming your loyalty, I will not deny you. I am a Seventh-day Adventist. I do believe. Mingling with those that you should avoid and refusing to see the suffering and self-denial in being a disciple. We need to see these things. We need to watch our head. I like this statement by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you don't know who he is, you can look him up. He was an incredible, he's not a Seventh-day Adventist, but he was a, a very um, 
real follower of Christ. He said, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you everything. It begins with your thoughts. Where you end up in eternity is happening right here, right now. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? It begins with your thoughts. So we have some warnings again, just recapping this. We need to surrender our preconceptions, our own ideas about how things should be or are going to be. We need to base it on, it is written. It is written. We need to surrender our self-confidence and pride. We need to surrender our love of ease. We need to surrender the desire to be accepted by the world. We need to surrender our physical comforts and even sleep when we should be praying. We need to surrender and realize that if we choose not to surrender, that will render the keenest blow to the heart of the one who died just so you could have the chance to be saved. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. The prince of this world cometh, said Jesus, and hath nothing in me. His thought was where it needed to be. His, his head was right. There was in him nothing that responded to Satan's sophistry. He did not consent to sin, not even by a thought did Jesus yield to temptation. It starts with the thoughts. So it may be with us. Let's read that in red together. Not even by a thought did Jesus yield to temptation. So it may be with us. Yes. Philippians 2.5 tells us that let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. In Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, in closing, this is our last passage. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We need to watch our heads and what's going on in our thoughts, and we need to watch our head, who is Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Where does sin begin? Begins in the mind. When temptation is cherished, we think about it, that's where it happens. Lay aside the weight, lay aside the sin which so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, our head, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. And if we're faithful, brothers and sisters, the Bible says in Revelation that those who overcome are going to sit with Him in His throne. Amen. If anybody has grandkids, if anybody has a niece or nephew, you like them to sit in your lap, don't you? You want them to be with you. And that's what God says about us. I want you with me in my throne. So Jesus has gone through the crisis ahead of us. He has shown us the path to victory. He has shown us the self-denial the earnest prayer, the complete surrender, the diligent, consistent life. And that's what it's going to take if you intend to be in heaven with Jesus for eternity. Let's close with prayer.